creativity, energy, initiative, persistence, and guts to do so. And he was successful. In 1939, he was employing 90 people in a real high-tech video manufacturing company. And then, Prava faced the first disruption. And it was pretty much the ultimate disruption, World War II. And at the later part of the war, when the German cities started to get bombed, Prava was relocated, like most companies. It was relocated to Bergstadtka and Valpeur, and it went through the experience of all the German companies that produced anything that could be used for wars. So the Nazis told us what to use. And the Nazis told us who to produce it with. So Brava employed Horst Lehor. We had a camp late from Russia. They were located right next to our friend in Valpeur. And we couldn't find much in our historical archives about this phase in our history. Um, but we didn't also find anything that the British forces who freed um, Germany from the Nazis or prosecuted any one of our guys or anything. So maybe we treated our forced labor the way we treated our other labor, hopefully so. So, next phase, the German economic miracle. And Trotter was part of that. Franz Baumgartner started in, in 1947. He tried to collect all the, the people that he could find, his old machinery, he went to the ruins of his old buildings to restart, and again, he had to have lots of initiative, creativity, know-how, energy, and guts. And he was successful again. So based on his innovative leadership, Frava started to grow into many applications combining relays. So we went into elevator control systems. We designed the first central control system for the lighting systems in Cologne, which was operated by Konrad Adenauer. We supposedly designed the first green way connecting different traffic lights so that we can have a green way going through the street. And Mr. Baumgartner was very strong in medical devices. So he designed um, a mobile dialysis system and he also designed, and we're talking about the 50s here, a voice-controlled wheelchair for people who didn't have any arms. So he was a very successful guy, and in 1968, Fowler was celebrating the 15th anniversary, and that's where my personal memory comes into play. Because Franz Baumgartner had hired my dad and as a sales agent for the Ruhr Industrial Valley area in 1950. And my dad had to give a speech at this event, which took place 50 years ago at the Flora, which is a very nice event place in the city. And our star guest in those days was Roberto Blanco. <laughs> he's still around, yeah, so he's a real persistent guy too, you know? And uh, I recollect, I was eight years old, and I recollect my dad practicing for the speech in our living room. <laughs> so this was 1968, and Franz Baumgarten was eight years old, so he was approaching the first generational change, and he gave the company to his two nephews, Adolf Zierold and Wolfgang Wasserhess. And Wolfgang Wasserhess, um, he gave us an interview about three weeks ago about the historical stuff, so some of the information I have here is from him. And his son, Sebastian, is here because he himself couldn't come. I'm very happy, Sebastian, that you're here with us. Um, He gave the company to his two nephews in a very 
challenging time for him because Rob was going to face the first digital disruption in 1968, 69-70 because the transistors on integrated circuits started to work and they were replaced with a whole lot of applications that Fala was solving with combinations of relays. So the first wave of this disruption was something that Fala was able to deal with because Fala started to do microprocessor control. And the big companies see them as AG and so Schneider Group maybe in those days, they either did PLCs, programmable logical controls, or CNCs. And PLCs couldn't do numeric controls, and CNCs couldn't do money controls. In between was a big, big collection of little market niches that were service to companies like Power. But then the PLCs started to do numerical control. So Brava, with the second wave of this digital disruption, was driven out of this main market. And all of these factors led to the situation that in 1993, Axelima, who was in those days the general manager of the only product of the Brava that was valuable on the encoders, and my brother Abhi and myself were quite the company. And how did we get into that situation? Achim and myself, who used to be management consultants and uh, working for very big companies as consultants, we witnessed very many situations how big companies treat young people. People who start their working career with this idea of changing the world. Big companies teach them very fast that they won't change anything except themselves. So they do change themselves. They lose their ideals, their dreams, and they start to become what I would call adjusted organizational optimizers. And on this process, in this process, they lose a part of their soul. So Achim and I we were dreaming about we can do this much better. And we were dreaming and discussing, but at the same time, we were doing a job that was pretty demanding. And we were sitting in a gold cage where we were making tons of money. And it was fun too. So at a certain point in time, we realized that we don't do something drastic, or today we would say disruptive. We will continue to do so until we are retired. So we decided to quit our jobs. And we told our dad, our clients, and our dad was all in. He loved this idea. And he said, I know a company you can buy. It's our. They are controlled. They have, they have potential and all these things. And I know them. So you have to talk about Sanima, which we did. We met them in our parents' house. And two weeks later, we signed a contract. So, Akim and I, we kind of put our dreams into writing. The Frau Star, by the way. And at the end of slide, the front of slide says, for our customers, we achieve excellent results without sacrificing our new employees. Open and honestly, we stand by each other, always treating others respectfully, and we enjoy seeing ourselves. And the four values are competence in our world is something that you don't get from your boss. You have to create yourself. It's based on your creativity, your initiative, your persistence, your energy in your guts. Next value is total information. So I'm going to have a new this organization where information cannot be used as a currency of power, as it is being done in most organizations. And to do that, we said all the information that we own, we will open up to all of people. And all the decisions that we make, we will publish right away. We will not think about the effect of what this decision will do in terms of what people, because if we start motivating more people, we also start manipulating them. So our goal is to emancipate them. Okay, another one. Dynamic development. The overriding goal of all of our people is to make ourselves dispensable. Because 
We're not willing to make ourselves sensible. We're not willing to for a normal way so we can use the place in organization. But you cannot do this without having leaders that reward people that make themselves the sensible. And the last one is fair sharing. So we believe that we can economically be very successful on the balanced states, working with our suppliers, with our customers on the same level, and also without forcing our employees to sell their soul. So we don't want to force them to do things that they think are unfair. On the other hand, if you, as one of our employees, make a decision, it's yours. It is your personal decision. There's no way that you can use this excuse of, I had to do this. Okay, that is our dream. So, here comes our first day of work. So, we're standing here, and our employees were there, and some of them are here. I'm very happy about that. We have some of our older alumni here. So, we're presenting this, and then we have the reality check. Because we were talking <laughs> to a group of people who just couldn't believe what we were saying. They had gone through very hard times. They had seen all kinds of people starting to organize the organization for themselves. Now we come and say, oh, I told them. So it was a very, very tough time in the early years because we didn't realize that we were fighting against each other. Although we only had one common goal, and that was to stay alive. And it's very sad because we have to fight against the unions, we have to fight against the workers' council, we also have to fight against the employer association because all the old the structures don't like that. But eventually we were able to stay alive. In 1997, we were able to stop shrinking, stop firing. We started to hire and grow and make money. And so we thought, oh, after two years of that, now we have to invest. So we started our office in Princeton, where probably five or ten years to grow. And then we continued to be the old business system, uh, and money started coming in. We didn't pay any dividends, so we were able to put some money aside. We had some financial reserves, and, and after we I started to grow the patient because we didn't like our business system. Our business system was based on individual know-how carried by individuals. Know-how, which is not systematic, cannot be scaled up, cannot be duplicated, you cannot transfer. And after that, we were envisioning that eventually we had to go global. We would have to grow. So in 2004, we made two very basic decisions, two of them make or break it. And the first one was, we don't want to change our basic business system. We will go away from the crafted system into what we call mass customization. To do that, we decided to stop manufacturing in Germany and to go to a low labor cost country and work with unskilled labor. So we gave us two and a half years to transfer all this individual knowledge into our computer systems, which at this point in time didn't exist yet. Okay, so we made that decision. I can never remember the case of everybody but I and myself, and a couple of these guys are here today. They were red ears and red cheeks, and they all thought these guys are nuts. Okay, then the second decision we made was we have to work away from optics. Because optics is a technology that's old, and the innovation of optics was taking place in basics and in interfaces. And both of these forms of our own control. So we were losing value added to suppliers, which is very bad because if you continue to do so, eventually you're a system integrator and you don't have to pay any value added yourself. So in 2004, we made another very interesting decision. We said we will go to the mechanics and trading power. Um, so we were, Kevin and I were pretty happy, but everybody else thought it was crazy, and then we started to do a more business, and then we made our first very big mistake. One year later, I think we lost our 
judgment, because then we decided to go into the whole new technology with our first new dollar company called the Tecton. And the idea was to create a new human based technology, and we failed and spared the failure of this thing. It cost us a few million euros later. So that was our big disaster, which we experienced, which I hope we will remember for a long time to not do it again. Mm -hmm. So then, the G Day for our new business system was January 1, 2007. And we didn't have a plan B. So we knew that we had to be able to produce all of our orders by this date with this new system, with the new plan that we built in Poland with the new IT system. And I guess again, everybody except Achim and myself thought this is for sure a highway to hell. And our guys and our leaders thought so even more when we were getting closer to the D-Day. And we didn't um, take that risk of reaching our friends. We overrode and overrode our leaders. And then something happened. We weren't able to exceed ourselves. Here comes January 2. We're shipping orders. And three and four and five next week. And none of our customers felt this change in our basic business system. Um, and this is one of the examples where we're able to exceed ourselves. The problem was to get there, we had to override some of our experienced leaders. And for them, the pain of being overridden was higher than the joy of exceeding themselves. And we lost some people, which is always that. We're very sad. But we were able to exceed ourselves, 2007. And then um, our innovation rate started to grow in uh, 2010, I think. We started from, uh, oh, it was 11. We started two offices in Hell and in Aachen. Our RT center in Aachen and our corporate headquarters in Hell. In 2013, we bought the leading car technology. In 2014, we started our office in Shanghai. In 2015, we launched our new line of products based on magnetics and reading wire, which opened up a whole new future market for us, integrated more effective systems. In 2017, we had shipped half a million reading wire sensors. And here we are today. We're alive. And it's not just us. You know, our business is alive, but our flower star is alive. For our customers, we achieve excellent results without sacrificing our human qualities. We open and honestly stand by each other, always treating each other respectfully, and we enjoy ourselves, exceeding ourselves. Now, when I say this now, nobody is telling me I'm completely crazy. Because for the last 25 years, we have been able to go through this whole process of ups and downs without losing our values. And we are very alive, you know, we are grown. 20 something percent in the last couple of years, and the growth rate is growing. You know, uh, if there's a pattern for this success, one word it's trust. It's trust in ourselves, it's trust in our colleagues, it's trust in our suppliers, it's trust in our customers. So, the success is based on the trust that we have here together because we are our colleagues. You are our suppliers, you are our customers. So, it's time to say thank you. Thank you for your trust. <laughs> and there are two guys that need a very special thank you. And that is Axel Diemann and my brother Abby. Without their trust, and their contributions and their willingness to exceed themselves, 
we for sure wouldn't have been here. So, Axel, we can't hear you. No, this is somewhere on the trip. Thank you, Axel. And thank you, Axel. So let me please finish the speech on a very personal note. Tanya, you are the most special person in my life. You have gone through many downs and ups, but you have found, without any permission for your trust in your love. So thank you very, very much. I love you.